Good morning and welcome to day three, the final day of the 19th annual BC Natural Resources Forum. I'm Sarah Weber, President and CEO of C3 Alliance Corp and Chair of the Forum Advisory Committee. Before we jump into today's events, we would like to once again acknowledge that the virtual conference, while broadcasting across the province, is produced within the areas we know today as Vancouver and Prince George. The studios are located on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil tooth Nations and the clayton Tene First Nation. We honour their language, culture and history. We've got another exciting day for you, starting off with the Minister's Roundtable. This will be followed by a keynote provided by Sue Page, CEO at the Digital Technology Supercluster. And finally, we are pleased to have a fireside chat moderated by Joel Mackay, CEO of Northern Development Initiative Trust. So let's kick things off. Up first, I'm pleased to pass the virtual mic over to this session sponsor, Tourmaline. Tourmaline will introduce our moderator and welcome the Minister's Roundtable. Good morning. My name is Leah Turner and I am the Director of Public Affairs here at Tourmaline, uh, Canada's largest natural gas producer. I'm pleased to be joining you today from Calgary, which is located in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina, the Mountain Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. This is the third year that Tourmaline has proudly sponsored the Minister's Breakfast and the second year that the pandemic has disrupted our plans to meet in person. I want to thank the C3 Alliance for making sure that we can still gather virtually today to talk about the natural resources sector. I'd also like to commend the natural gas industry for navigating challenging circumstances throughout the pandemic and this most recent deep freeze while continuing to ensure to Canadians have access to reliable, affordable and sustainable energy. At Termaline, our goal is to produce the lowest emission natural gas in the world and we are well on our way. This fall, we were thrilled to share that we exceeded our target to reduce methane emissions by 25% three years ahead of schedule. We're relentlessly pursuing greater emission reduction opportunities across our operations while continuously improving all aspects of our environmental performance. We share the BC government's goal to create a cleaner, more prosperous tomorrow, and we are excited about what the future holds. On that note, I'd like to thank you ministers for taking the time to speak with us today. We look forward to hearing your thoughts. And without further ado, I will introduce our esteemed panel moderator, Sharon Singh, a partner at Bennett Jones LLP. Sharon, thank you for guiding the discussion today. Thank you, Leah, and thank you for calling me esteemed. Um, thank you all of, uh, all of you joining us today this morning. And I join you from the territories of the Squamish, Musqueam and tsleil peoples. And I acknowledge that many of you are tuning in from the territories of other nations. In terms of an introduction, all one really needs to know here is that the work and policies these ministers do and their respective ministries do advance the important natural resources sector. They're important to Canada. So, and you can read the bios, frankly, online. And to you, the panelists, ministers, you may remember this, but it's the job of everyone outside of government to always point out the flaws. The flaws to laws, the flaws to your policies, the flaws to the program and point out the situation could be better and for you to go the government to tout all the actions that you're taking to make it better. And I'm saying this not as a bad joke, guys, because I'm prone to make many of those, but I acknowledge at the outset that it's hard to govern. It's hard to please, it's hard to lead, and importantly, it's really hard to come up with solutions. And with that, let me sort of frame what I hope our, where our discussion sort of takes us. And I've been listening to the past few days uh, on the forum, and a common theme that's been restated by many on this forum, including Mr. Ralston, is the opportunity for British Columbia, the opportunity to lead the global quest to decarbonize, the opportunity presented by investors, many others, pricing climate change risk, pricing the systemic and physical risks, and how this opportunity actually is a natural advantage for us to grow the sector. So speaking very plainly, in BC, we have many natural advantages, as the minister said yesterday, including the fact that we can supply low carbon resources, but BC also has the advantage of being able to supply the increased demand for resources that are actually needed to you know, achieve a lower carbon future. For example, the minerals and metals needed for renewables uh, like wind, turbine, the electric vehicles, the infrastructure. So the natural advantage, uh, frankly, should be should be something that we use to grow the tent uh, that is now the natural resources sector. And that, to me, uh, means that the imminent debt of the traditional industries, many of which you uh, is in your in your ministries are is, is understated. 
uh, and, uh, and frankly too early. The second theme that we've heard is one that's connected to but distinct from this global transition is the legal and moral imperative to continue to take action towards achieving reconciliation. And let me get to the point quickly here too. The foundation of reconciliation rest and must necessarily do so on change. And I know that change we're seeing through Section 7 agreements with the Teltan, the mineral tenures that were announced yesterday being surrendered in sensitive watershed, UNDRIP's implementation, old growth forest, forest deferrals, et cetera. And so there's one common theme, uh, an issue that industry, government, and the nation can commiserate over. It is the sheer volume of change that's under consideration and the discussion uh, and, and on our regulatory and policy framework, be it driven by reconciliation or the need to address climate change. And Minister Ralston, this question is really meant for you, um, uh, and I want you to kick it off, but given this breadth and volume change in the sector, uh, and, and you know, deserves to be supported by inclusive process and capacity, capacity to input in an informed and deliberate and strategic manner the changes that we're making. So it has stickiness. So given the staggering amount here, um, how are you and your ministry working to attract investment in the sector? And in some instances, maintaining that investment despite the uncertainty, despite the commentators, um, media, and certain analysts, be it fair or otherwise, saying that you know there is regulatory risk in, in Canada, there is permitting risk in, uh, in Canada and in BC. Well, well, thanks very much. I think everyone understands in the COVID era that change is a constant, and I, I agree with the way in which you framed the questions. Uh, any of the things that we do are based on uh, some of the principles that you've talked about, uh, uh, indigenous partnerships, strong environmental standards, regulatory predictability, and efficient and timely processing of permits. And so we want to have a competitive, well-regulated oil and gas sector, mining sector, and increasingly alternate energy sector. Um, but let me give a few examples uh, of what I think you're referring to when you talk about change. Uh, the Supreme Court of uh, British Columbia brought down a decision uh, uh, for, on behalf of the Blueberry Nation and the province uh, in the summer um, and uh, decided that uh, the cumulative effects uh, uh, had an impact upon the, the treaty that uh, the Blueberry signed in uh, 1900, uh, Hunting and Fishing Treaty, and uh, that the, the province had not met its obligations under the treaty. So um, we are in the process of, uh, and I'm uh, working with Minister Rankin on that, uh, have a, a very skilled team, former Deputy Minister Lauren Brownsey, former Indigenous leader, both at the local and national level, Bob Chamberlain, who are heading up the negotiations. Uh, and we've, we've made progress with an interim agreement. And uh, what we're uh, in the process of negotiating, uh, uh, I think, and making good progress, is, uh, is a new uh, uh, approvals process that will uh, take into account the, uh, the, uh, the directions of the court. Uh, and so that's an example of change, but where uh, the ministry is uh, able to pivot and adapt and uh, and move forward in building a strong, strong, continue to build the strong sector there. The, another example of where uh, there is change is a, a royalty review of the oil and gas sector, long overdue. Um, we uh, hired uh, a, a couple of uh, well-recognized experts, uh, Dr. Winter from the University of Calgary and Dr. Olaweiler from, uh, from uh, Simon Fraser University. Uh, we've had a public comment period and we're um, moving forward, uh, generally the, the advice on royalty review and systems changes is to do them quickly uh, and uh, in a comprehensive way. But industry has been uh, consulted, the public's been consulted. I think there are five industry tables. So uh, again, the pace there is, is fast, but uh, uh, I'm convinced that we'll have a, a, a royalty system that uh, more better reflects uh, the reality of uh, the oil and gas sector in in the present era, and finally, just in in mines, uh, the mining sector, uh, the mining sector in British Columbia is booming. I think, uh, as you've said in your introduction, it's uh, it's our time. Um, but one of the ways in which we've helped that we created a, a new uh, role of a chief permitting officer who is separate from the inspector of mines. The auditor general had suggested strongly that those roles be separated because they were sometimes in conflict. So, so we, we've done that. And I think we're, we're having an impact. Uh, 
Newcrest Mining, which is a global major in the mining sector, um, uh, made an investment uh, buying the Bruce Jack Mine from Predium Resources, uh, 3.2 billion Canadian. And what uh, um, the, uh, the the president, the CEO, Sandy Biswas, said is that British this property is a, is a premier property in what he regards as a premier mining jurisdiction in the world. So. So yes, uh, there's change, uh, and and uh, but I, I think we're making good progress uh, towards our goal of uh, building a prosperous, uh, uh, low carbon future for British Columbia. So thanks. Thank you, Minister Alston. And since you mentioned Minister Rankin, maybe um, I can go to you next, Minister Rankin. Um, and let me just pick up on, on on this theme because I think it deserves um, greater uh, elaboration. So you know. Often we hear that there's a permitting risk and that's linked to uh, Indigenous peoples. And too often, I think that's interpreted as, well, it's the Indigenous peoples that are creating the risk. When really, the way I look at it is, it's actually our inaction to give the due respect, acknowledgement, recognition to the rights of Indigenous peoples that's creating the risk. So, um, you know, frame it the other way. And I, I think the draft action plan, just to pick up on, on uh, some of the comments Mr. Rallison made in terms of the strategy to get to a place where we, we are growing the sector, it speaks to some of these issues and it's amb ambitious uh, and necessarily should be uh, and requires significant resources to execute. So uh, and I also acknowledge that, you know, you're not waiting for it to, to be um, uh, finalized before you start implementing some of the measures like the Lake Babi Nation and the Interpretation Act changes. But I'm hoping because that's an area that this I'm sure this industry and many of those that are listening are very, very uh, interested in. If you could just update us on what's happening with the draft action plan, when will it be finalized? What are the next steps? And some of the challenges that you foresee uh, you'll face when you're implementing it and how the government industry and others listening on this call can help you to overcome these challenges. Well, thanks very much, Sharon. And thank you uh, to the organizers for the invitation. I really look forward to this discussion with uh, you and my uh, my colleagues. Um, I think you're right. We start with the, uh, the act uh, UNDRIP as the framework under which we do reconciliation in British Columbia. I want to remind everyone this was passed uh, by every legislator in the legislature that day. It's not a particular uh, party's uh, program. In fact, it was a commitment that all uh, legislators made to the people of British Columbia, to Indigenous peoples in British Columbia, because at the bottom, it's a human rights bill. But it also is so much more, as you alluded to. We've had so much uncertainty. The status quo uh, was not working for, for anyone, really. And so we've tried to find a better path forward. <clears throat> We sort of started with the enactment, but then we had an action plan commitment that you alluded to. And we've come up with in an early draft, 79 very concrete things that every single ministry of our government was committed to and will be held accountable to in annual reports going forward. So that I think gives some people comfort that it's not simply going to be aspirational things, but rather very concrete things involving education and environment and uh, child care, all the way to, of course, the resource sector that we're uh, concerned with. Um, we hope to get the final version out in the spring of this year. It's but obviously a function of trying to work as we are required to in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples. And with the heat dome and the flooding and the pandemic and the findings at Kamloops, obviously people have been, diff it's been difficult to engage to the degree we committed to. But I think in the spring we'll have the final version out and I hope people believe that we have struck the right balance. Now as for the role of industry, <clears throat> I really believe that supporting reconciliation of Indigenous peoples with the non-Indigenous population it should be seen as a, a core theme and in the interests of, of industry in our, in our province. Building partnerships is obviously where it's at. People have heard that endlessly, but it's economically required in the future. And I believe that advancing reconciliation recon also is consistent, as Minister Ralston said, with this government's ESG commitments. I think we have something to tell the world with the quality of our carbon plan, our, our clean BC plan. 
but we also have something to tell the world that this is the first jurisdiction that embraced the UNDRIP and the first jurisdiction, therefore, that is trying to put meat on the bones of that and working with industry to provide economic uh, measures to take into account the self-determination, the inherent right to self-government on the ground is important and obviously in attracting capital and making this the caliber of the jurisdiction that, that Minister Ralston referred to. Now, we've done some great things. You alluded to the Lake Babine uh, Nation and uh, the foundation agreement with a 20-year pathway to create greater prosperity, sharing free forest resources and all sorts of other things. We've also had work done with uh, on the foresty front with the Sisha Nation and with Taltan, a land use planning process. I'll come to section seven in, in, later in, uh, in my remarks. But I think these are, are ambitious new initiatives. Our government passed a number of uh, uh, measures in the last session of the legislature uh, pursuant to the Declaration Act, uh, involving more responsibility for First Nations and jurisdiction over education and childcare and the like. And I think all in all, this government is trying to ensure that the lofty goals, the lost, lofty promises that we made with respect to the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People are enacted, are implemented in our province. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you, Minister Rankin. And I know you can talk about this file because you're clearly passionate about it. But let me connect the two things between Minister Ravelson and Minister Rankin to talk about your ministry, um, Minister Conroy, and I'm looking at you because you're at the bottom of my screen there. Um, you're at the forefront of uh, your ministry is at providing access to the land base. And as someone other than me said, so don't don't shoot me, um, the way Flynnrow is currently constructed, it's too large. It's uh, ineffective to be able to respond to the emerging opportunities to address the challenges that you, the government has identified as, as, as its priorities, reconciliation, natural stewardship of, of resources, economic development that's sustainable. And last year when we spoke, um, the reorganization was very much in, in early phases, but your hope was that it would create a more efficient and responsive uh, organizational design in terms of what would come out of it. So could you just update us on the status of the reorganization? What can we expect in terms of land use uh, planning processes, permitting authorizations? You know, Minister Rankin and Mr. Ralston touched on some of those, but um, especially given, you know, in, in the mandate um, that you have to create new collaborative um, share decision-making mo models for the resource base um, uh, according to principles of under. Well, thank you, Sharon, and it's really great to be here. And, and I just want to point out that I'm actually in the Kootenai, so I'm on the traditional territories of the Shuepam, the Okanagan, the Snake, and, and the Tanaha Nations. And, and I was just thinking as uh, we were getting ready for this that uh, last year we were all very hopeful we would be in person and of course that's not happening. So, but it's great that we that we were able to come together this way. and. And yeah, I was in the early stages of the a new ministry when I uh, met last year and, and we had just started the discussions on this. And and what happened is a lands and natural resource operations secretariat was formed to actually help the government assess whether its land use objectives could be achieved much more effectively by modifying the structure of the natural resources ministries. And it's important to say that, you know, it's not just uh, Flynnrod, just my ministry, but other ministries too that are involved in natural resources. We're all sitting here today talking with you. And there was an assessment phase done and, and it involved really extensive consultation uh, across the province with, with industry, with local governments, with First Nations, um, non-government organizations, labor, uh, professional organizations, Crown Corporations, and a real cross-section of, of ministry staffs from across ministries from all, through, all throughout government. And it was, there was considerable, there, there's um, thousands of pages of, of information was gathered. It was a, a lot of work was done. It was really um, quite a, quite intensive and a, and a really great way of, of getting out and, and talking to people to to get feedback on because people have have said as you said that well not wasn't you that said it someone else said it but you repeated it you know that that it's it's an unwieldy uh, ministry but it um, you know it's it's uh, since I've been here for a year I've, I've recognized how efficient actually the the ministry is and the staff and what was interesting was the feedback from staff right across uh, ministries across the province um, saying that um, you know what worked and what didn't and what the, the feedback we also got was the way this is being carried out because 
uh, a lot of staff said when uh, something like this is proposed in the past, it's just been, they've been told, okay, you're doing this now with no input from the staff. So there was considerable input from the staff, which has really helped us. And so the secretary brought all that information together and brought forward some potential restructuring options. So the implement implementation phase, which is what will happen next, if, and I say if, the Premier, because it's it's up to uh, Premier Horgan to decide whether we go ahead with the restructuring or with the new ministry or what's going to happen. It's ultimately his decision. And if um, it's our understanding, if this is going to happen, these things would begin later this spring. So we're waiting for a decision from uh, the Premier. He's got lots of information to go through, a lot of work to, uh, to, uh, to be reading. Um, but land use planning and, and effective permitting and, and authorizations, you know, both of these issues um, are expected to be addressed in the restructuring. But I, I also think it's important to, to recognize that we didn't just sit around and, and wait for all this work to be done. Um, our ministry actually did work. We, um, for the first time in years, we actually were able to get more staffing to help with the permitting. And, and it's really, um, we put that staffing into areas in the province where there were backlogs. And it's really helped to achieve the, the processing of permitting in a lot more efficient manner. And we're going to continue to work on that. Uh, and, you know, we will await to see what, what uh, the Premier decides to see how the implementation phase will be carried out. But we know that it, it's whatever is going to be done has been done with uh, a lot of due diligence, a lot of, of work across ministries to, and across from input from people all across the province, stakeholders and other groups to make sure that uh, what, what happens is done in a way that's going to benefit everybody. So thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Mr. Conroy. Um, you know, I often say the two things that we can we can give each other are our capacity and, and time. And it seems like you've uh, you've definitely taken the lesson on that one and, and are doing it in a deliberate fashion. Let me uh, go to you, Mr. Heyman, next. And uh, on the theme that we we started with, which is the goal to get to net zero and the opportunity presents for BC's uh, natural resource sector and BC generally. Um, I, I, you know, I just wonder, is there a beautiful duet? Um, between the carrot and the stick policies such that at the end of the day, one is not, you know, looking at just the cap placed on emissions to mean that there is no potential for growth in this sector, that there is, uh, as some have said, uh, found, you know, these industries are foundational to getting to the globe to decarbonize. And is the aim through supporting innovation in areas like low carbon hydrogen, uh, forest-based bioeconomy, negative emissions technology, is the aim really to attract the investment into the sector, but attract the smarter investment that's necessary to achieve our, our net zero targets? So I'm hoping that you can help uh, cut through some of the noise and simplify for people like me that you know might not be so technically savvy. Some of the material commitments in the Clean BC uh, plan, the roadmap to 2030, and how it will impact the natural resources sector, and perhaps what um, steps that industry needs to take to capitalize on the on, on the opportunities that we know are are inherently there. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, first, I want to acknowledge that I'm uh, I'm joining people from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, and I also want to I, I I'm going to get a little general and then get a bit more specific. I, I want to acknowledge first of all that uh, um, as proud as I am of uh, the significant uh, work that uh, my ministry, all ministries, and uh, and our Climate Solutions Council have done on developing a robust uh, plan to reduce emissions. I think it's important to acknowledge that work on this began in uh, 2008 when Gordon Campbell brought in a, a carbon tax. And uh, that was a pretty novel idea at the time. And uh, I want to I wanna recognize how BC industry responded to that, uh, responded to that by, uh, as you say, uh, there's the stick and then there's a uh, the carrot. They responded to that by finding ways to reduce emissions to pay less carbon tax. And in, in the process, uh, developed a situation in BC where we have in many areas among the, the lowest carbon intense uh, commodities in the world. So fast forwarding to now, I, uh, I came back from, uh, uh, from Glasgow um, in December, the UN Climate Conference. Uh, a couple of weeks before that, we'd uh, released our uh, Clean BC uh, Roadmap to 2030, 
Uh, we were on the heels of uh, record wildfires, uh, heat domes, and then uh, shortly after the return, we had uh, three atmospheric rivers and uh, devastating uh, flooding in the Fraser Valley, in the interior, uh, and elsewhere. And I am absolutely sure that there isn't a person um, on this program today uh, or their families who aren't as concerned as I am about finding ways to address uh, the climate challenge so things do not get worse. And while doing that, I think uh, uh, what I've always said and what our government has always said is a climate plan that uh, destroys the economy isn't a plan. A uh, climate plan that doesn't help us transition and, uh, and build a cleaner and more diverse uh, economy isn't a plan. So when I was at, um, in Glasgow, I had the rare opportunity to speak to uh, Mark Carney, who's uh, former head of the uh, Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, and now uh, heads the global Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. And on the heels of BlackRock and other major investment companies announcing that uh, uh, they were now screening uh, their investments uh, to companies that were saying, uh, here's our plan to get to net zero. Here's our plan to reduce emissions. Here's our plan to transition. And that if those plans weren't there, uh, they weren't much interested. So in Glasgow, uh, Mark Carney announced a $130 trillion investment fund to decarbonize the global economy. And I would argue that British Columbia, because of uh, the work of successive governments and even more importantly the work of uh, people in the mining industry uh, people in the in the gas sector people in the forestry sector to be ahead of the curve and already demonstrate how emissions can be reduced we're in a good position to attract uh, outside investment i mean the proof will be in the pudding but i think uh, i think we've set ourselves up well the roadmap has many actions that focus on uh, different industries. We have a focus on ensuring that we uh, uh, we meet uh, sectoral emission reduction targets of 33 to 38% in oil and gas and 38 to 43 in industry generally, as well as uh, very substantial emission reductions in, uh, in building and, uh, and transportation. But our plan was um, developed with the Climate Solutions Council. And on that council are representatives from uh, the forest industry, from tech, from Shell, and every single recommendation from that council was uh, a consensus recommendation, which means I think that people thought it was ambitious, but doable and necessary. And uh, that led us to the various measures uh, in our roadmap to 2030. So whether it's uh, targeting 75% uh, reduction of methane by 2030 and near elimination by 2030, by 2035, whether it's uh, actions in the mining industry to electrify like projects like uh, Bruce Jack in Northwest BC, uh, converting from diesel to battery electric, whether it's, uh, it's significant uh, work by um, the oil and gas industry to uh, track down methane, to consider ways to reduce emissions, and also to begin investing in, uh, in clean hydrogen uh, as a transition fuel. Um, all of these are great opportunities uh, for British Columbia, and I, I look forward to uh, working with industry to do that. We know that the rest of the world is not where we are. We know there's competitive challenges, and that's why uh, in our um, in our carbon tax rebate programs, our, our, um, our incentives for industry, our co-investment and capital projects, we are doing what we can to keep uh, industry competitive while reducing emissions. I know we have more to do, and we're working on that with the Ministry of Finance. More to come. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I was just writing down that a plan that destroys the economy is not a plan, and I agree the plan is ambitious, doable, but necessary. And uh, in my blunt manner, I'll, I'll, I'll probably summarize what you've said is not molly coddling the industry to stifle innovation is, is really the plan here. Um, now, Miss, over to you, Mr. Callan, um, and, and I'll just pick on some of the um, themes from Minister um, uh, Heyman's comments here. And, you know, I reflect on what Premier Horgan uh, had said in terms of the forest workers, in terms of as, as you know, the pandemic, which has stopped us meeting in person, um, uh, sort of subsides and the economy bounces back, we need to do everything we can to support forest workers. And that includes the capturing the opportunity to transition this forest from high volume production to high value. 
Uh, and we know that forestry is a key feature in, in clean BC, including through the use of mass timber, which is, you know, your favorite topic. And because that's one way we can reduce the carbon footprint in our building sector. So, but, uh, you know, my question really is, apart from this local application, how do we leverage BC's leadership in sustainable forest management? How do we leverage the Indigenous partnerships that have been created, are being created, and the production of carbon storing products to be the partner of choice around the world, um, to be, you know, the jurisdiction that produces the products that the world needs globally? Um, and of course, this includes mass timber, but there is a full suite of products uh, that come from our, our forest fibers. Yeah, thank you, Sharon, and uh, it's nice to see you. I think last year we were on this panel thinking this might be the last time we do it virtually and we'll be able to do it in person, but uh, but here we are. Um, I, I too will acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, uh, the Musqueam and Swam, uh, Musqueam and uh, Tuatha Nations. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for your question, Sharon. I, uh, first off, let me say, I think we have one of the best managed force in the world. Um, but we can always be better. And I know that some of that work is happening. Minister Conroy is leading that work. Uh, we have to do a better job with our First Nations partners. Uh, that's critically important. And, uh, and hats off to Minister Conroy and Minister Rankin for the work uh, that they're doing. I used to have a, a coach that used to say, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Uh, and so that certainly is a mentality that we're taking in uh, with the work we're, uh, we're doing. Uh, it's clear, the Premier said it many times, that we need to find ways to add more value to our forest products. And, uh, and we uh, first off acknowledge that mass timber isn't the only product in the uh, uh, value added space. There's a lot of products in that space, but we do see a unique opportunity with, with mass timber. And, um, and, and one of the things I love about it is that it hits it's a triple word score uh, for, for the Scrabble, Scrabble players out there. Uh, there's innovation, it's good paying jobs for British Columbians, uh, and it helps us address climate change. And, and governments in the past have looked at mass timber and tried to think through how do we move this forward and 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 the and the focus in the in the past has been on on the supply side, and we're really looking more of a demand focus. And uh, I'm so grateful for the panel, the advisory group that we've struck. We've got people from the forest industry, we've got uh, local government, in First Nations representation, engineers, architects, uh, local um, uh, local governments. Uh, it's a very large list of people that we've put together, environmental movement, uh, and we've brought everybody to the table because these conversations are happening and they might as well happen at a table with us. And, uh, and what we've found from that table is, uh, is a plan. We've created a plan that will be launched very soon. I'm, I'm very, uh, uh, excited about it because I think there's some huge opportunities, but we haven't just waited for the plan. We've actually already started. Um, you know, we're using government procurement to help drive some of the, the demand. Uh, BCIT is going to have a brand new, uh, 18 story student housing. There's a project in Vernon. There's, uh, the Royal BC Museum, um, that, uh, pieces that have already started moving. There's two projects that I'm particularly excited about. One, a, a brand new fire hall in Saanich. Uh, it will be um, a first post-disaster building uh, that we're aware of in the world that we built from mass timber. And another building that we're helping finance in Vancouver, uh, which is uh, again, um, uh, I believe it's 18 stories or maybe between 12 and 18 stories, um, but no concrete and steel in the structure, 100% mass timber. And so it's very exciting to see that opportunity. Now you highlight in your question, how do we find opportunities to um, uh, uh, advance our opportunities with our climate change agenda? We have huge opportunities. And part of the work we're doing with our um, uh, economic plan, which will be launched uh, fairly soon, will be how do we harness uh, the opportunities ahead of us, but at the same time address some of the major challenges that we have. And so I'm, I'm super excited about that and, uh, and that'll be coming very soon. Thank you, Mr. Callan. Um, and speaking about plans, I can probably uh, get to you, Minister Allison, because I'm uh, interested to hear about the hydrogen plan. <laughs> Um, BC was the first province to introduce uh, this, this uh, business and environmental strategy as a way to achieving net zero emissions. Um, and you know, you've spoken about this. We're a market leader in hydrogen fuel technology, but that's not enough 
to achieve the vision that you've outlined in the uh, in, of the government's outline in the hydrogen plan. We need the infrastructure, and that means investment, investment in scaling up hydrogen production, establish, establishing the regional hyd hydrogen hubs, and deploying the medium to heavy duty fuel cells vehicles that that you reference. So, uh, how do you see the push to promote innovation, investment in the production and deployment of hydrogen? actually supporting the expansion of the traditional natural resources sector? Uh, well, um, thanks very much, uh, Sharon. Um, low carbon innovation is now part of the title of my ministry. So I think that gives you a sense of the focus that we've uh, pushed uh, on this. Uh, you, you're, you've acknowledged the, the hydrogen plan um, and there's a lot of work to do. Um, although British Columbia is, I think, uh, probably under-recognized here as a as a global leader in the fuel cell industry, I was uh, talking with the CEO of CellCentric, uh, which is a partnership, a global partnership of Global Volvo and a Global Daimler, so capitalized at 600 million euro. Uh, they're setting up two centers of uh, research and, and operation, one in Stuttgart in Germany and the other in Burnaby. And I said, well, that's, that's great that it's in Burnaby. Why is it in Burnaby? And what I was told was, um, Burnaby is the Silicon Valley of the hydrogen fuel cell uh, industry. It, it, it's a global leader. Now, it's not something we acknowledge uh, here as much as we should, but certainly uh, we've taken a couple of steps that I think will, will push innovation in the sector forward. We've, uh, along with the federal government of Shell Canada, we've uh, funded uh, the Centre for Innovation and Clean Energy, which will have as one of its uh, topics of uh, research and funding, uh, hydrogen, along with uh, carbon capture, uh, renewable natural gas, uh, and battery uh, storage. Um, uh, so, so I think the the incentive to uh, innovate here in British Columbia is is captured uh, in, in that institution. But there are many other. Uh, companies and institutions here in British Columbia that are advancing that agenda. And then, then the other, finally, just the other tangible uh, step that we've taken is, uh, and there's a lot of interest from uh, uh, majors in hydrogen production here in British Columbia, uh, they will get uh, under the uh, plan the, uh, that we've devised with uh, BC Hydro, our crown subsidiary, uh, crown-owned uh, subsidiary, uh, a reduction, an incentive re uh, reduction of the industrial rate of electricity uh, for establishing new businesses in the sector. So a lot of interest and uh, I'm really optimistic. Uh, hydrogen isn't the entire answer to the low carbon economy, but it's certainly an important ingredient in British Columbia has a lot to offer both to Canada and to the world uh, as uh, in, in its leadership in this sector. Thank you, Minister Allison. I, and I forgot to mention, um, I was very impressed by your speech yesterday, mostly because you, you, you have this innate ability to keep on top of some of the things that are happening in the industry. So you mentioned Kendra Johnson, Anna Stukas, and Jessica Verhagen, all your friends of mine getting the Business in Vancouver 40 Under 40 Award. And um, I'm just I'm just thanking you for being so on top of LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever it is that you you typically employ. So um, thank you because that shows a deep interest in in those that are innately part of part of this industry. Um, Mr. Callan, maybe I can just switch back to you really quickly because um, you know when we're talking about hydrogen, um, as I understand it, in addition to providing sort of the policy supports for increasing hydrogen demand. Uh, and, and de-risking the development of hydrogen infrastructure, BC is also aiming to provide incentives to direct and support um, hydrogen businesses through uh, it, you know, the NBC investment fund that you're responsible for. So can you update us on the NBC fund and the progress made so far? Because last year, uh, I think it was you know, foreshadowed, uh, but uh, no details were available. So you were shy about talking about it. And I was hoping you could perhaps also touch on, um, uh, and I know this is, uh, uh, something that may come out of the left field, but I think it's close to you, your heart anyways. Some of the panels yesterday on Nilo Edwards, um, uh, in the, uh, panel of sellers, uh, Kira Sanky and others, were talking about um, how BC needs something to assist Indigenous communities in accessing capital and reducing the very real barriers uh, that that lack of finance has. So something like, um, but maybe not uh, the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities 
Corporation. Is the government considering such a potential approach? So two questions, the NBC fund, what's happening? And then uh, this Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corp style um, uh, organization. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Uh, a good memory. Uh, I was very vague last uh, year because we hadn't announced uh, NBC uh, yet, but uh, we're very proud of NBC. Uh, half a billion dollars that's dedicated to support innovation, to scale up companies uh, and help anchor them here in British Columbia. We think that's a huge opportunity and we believe this fund will have an impact uh, not only on Indigenous communities, not only in rural communities, but also to support our resource sector uh, for that important uh, in innovations and technology that we're going to need to continue to meet our climate change objectives. Um, we have um, uh, modeled this off of um, uh, a fund similar to the Danish Strategic in fund Investment Fund, uh, also uh, the Irish Strategic Investment Fund and Scotland. So this fund isn't a, a new model. The triple bottom line model is not new. Um, it's uh, being used well, well in Europe and, and they were kind enough to give us advice on how we could structure uh, the fund here. Uh, Jill Earthy is our new CEO. We were able to announce her just before um, the, the Christmas break. Uh, we're excited to have her there and uh, a new uh, chief investment officer um, will be announced uh, fairly soon. I know that work is ongoing with the board. Uh, I think it's important to highlight that this board uh, is uh, and in particular, the chief investment officer has independent decision making uh, powers uh, under legislation. So uh, it doesn't. So what it means is uh, myself as a minister or anyone in government can't be directing uh, those investments. Um, and that I hope will give some confidence to the private sector to be able to invest uh, along with this fund, very similar to what's happening in in funds uh, in in Europe. I know that uh, we've been having lots of engagement, part of our economic plan with uh, Indigenous and First Nation communities about how do we um, work together to enhance economic development opportunities. Uh, and there's a lot of good ideas coming forward. Uh, Minister Rankin and I are working closely uh, with leadership on what does that mean? How do we move forward in a good way? Uh, and, uh, and we'll have more to say, but there are funds that we've had made available. NBC has a mandate to support Indigenous communities. Uh, so that'll be important. Uh, Minister uh, Rolston had the First Nations uh, Clean Energy Fund, which just recently gave uh, $18 million to, I believe, 130 communities uh, for um, to support uh, energy transition. Uh, and there's going to be a whole host more uh, programs available. We we believe, uh, and I think most British Columbians believe, that uh, when Indigenous communities do well, everybody does well. And, and if we want to unlock the true potential of British Columbia, uh, it's going to mean uh, working with Indigenous communities to see uh, economic opportunities rise to the front. Thank you, Mr. Callan. And since we're uh, getting updates from everybody, perhaps Mr. Rankin, I can turn it over to you to give us an update on what's happening at the various negotiation tables. Um, or the issues that are top of mind for this province. So Minister um, Ralston touched on um, the Treaty 8 uh, negotiating round tables, perhaps if there's something else you want to add to that, I'd welcome it. And also the MOU with the Wet'suwet'en. Um, and before anybody uh, gives a hard time to the minister through questions, you know, there was a pandemic uh, and the nation was tied up in dealing with that. So, uh, and, and to, the, uh, to the extent that you can, uh, something that's also top of mind is the challenge by the Gitgala on the mineral, um, the, the free entry system. And and when you're providing these updates, perhaps you can also reflect on, you know, what are what are some of the issues that you're you're listening uh, to at, at these various tables? And the, what you're trying to balance in terms of the needs uh, of the province and, and, and the needs that you're hearing at these tables that keep you up at night? Thanks, thanks very much, Sharon. And uh, <clears throat> that's a quite a pretty tall order in three or four minutes to uh, to do justice to the questions you've asked, but I'll probably start with the with Soweton because I know that's been a, in the news a great deal. Um, there's actually two issues. There's the our objective of trying to work under the MOU to negotiate title and rights in the territory, the Yinta of the Wet'suwet'en uh, nation, and we have tried very hard to achieve to work with the Wet'suwet'en people to achieve unity. Uh, as between the different communities, some the western side and the eastern side are very different and the elected versus the hereditary, of course, is a conflict that people will know. But we are we remain optimistic. I met up there in September with the um, 
with uh, many of the leaders, the hereditary leaders, and then the elected, and then people in the community, uh, non-Indigenous people, to make sure they knew what we were trying to do. And uh, I think that, uh, as you alluded to, the pandemic has made it difficult. Doing these kind of things by Zoom is never easy. Um, we are hoping we can re-engage. Now, in the face of that is the second thing I mentioned. First is the objective of negotiating rights and title, which we think is much better than going to court. And the second is, of course, the controversy over the uh, CGL pipeline project. And I think it's fair to say there's a great difference of opinion, both in Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities in that area. And so navigating uh, through that in our main objective, which is to, uh, to get uh, the Wet'suwet'en to be able to uh, resume negotiations with us uh, and get to uh, make the progress we've made elsewhere in the province is uh, uh, my preoccupation. My What you said keeps me up at night for sure. We have provided a significant amount of money, $7.22 million to the uh, hereditary chief leadership to uh, see if they can uh, do con a constitution building unity you know reunification of the of the people and obviously it's for the nation to decide how it wishes to present itself to government um, in some parts of the province it's elected leadership that we engage with or industry engages with in other parts of the province uh, it's a fused leadership and in other parts of the province first nation presents through a hereditary system the province is open to all of that each nation can decide under the right of self-determination how they wish to present. And of course, that is the uh, the challenge uh, we face in, in Wet'suwet'en. I remain optimistic. The second uh, big issue you asked me to update on is the uh, the issue of the uh, blueberry. Uh, Minister Ralston spoke uh, quite, <laughs> I summarized it very effectively, I thought. Uh, we had a court case. The court decided in a very long and thorough a thoughtful judgment that the uh, province had not, uh, through the cumulative effects of the permitting in the oil and gas and forestry sector, had impaired the rights that were granted under the 1900 treaty uh, in Treaty 8. It was a big victory for uh, the Blueberry River First Nations. My view is we, we made the right decision not to appeal that, to, to roll up our sleeves instead, work with industry, work with the nations to see if we can come up to, a, to come up with a better uh, solution. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, as Minister Ralston said, we've retained a highly respected uh, former public servant, uh, federal and provincial, Lauren Brownsey, uh, as well as Bob Chamberlain, a, a well-regarded re well uh, Indigenous leader, and they have been working with Blueberry and with the other Treaty 8 nations at a collective table, because obviously the cumulative effects, in judgment affects all of the, the nations in, in Northeast British Columbia. Um, just a couple, just last week, the chief uh, of the uh, Blueberry River First Nations, uh, Marvin Yahe, was, de was defeated by Judy Desjarlais, and she is within, uh, I think mid-February will, under their rules, uh, become the uh, uh, chief of the Blueberry River First Nations. She has a background in industry and uh, in the oil and gas industry, and uh, we are hopeful that we can uh, uh, conclude these negotiations in the near term. Uh, there is a, a strategic solutions table with industry. I have, I'm well aware uh, in conversations with industry about what this judgment has meant in terms of uncertainty on the ground. Uh, Minister Ralston and I have been up to the, uh, uh, the region and met with many people uh, uh, in, uh, in, in local government and the like, but we're also, of course, regularly uh, engaged uh, in Zoom calls with uh, industry who have uh, impressed upon us the need to get on with permitting. And of course, we're balancing that need with the longer term picture of trying to restore uh, balance, what we call, what the First Nation has termed healing the land. And that I think is important if we're going to restore uh, moose populations and the like. And if we can get the land back to what it was through reclamation, there's been great success with dormant wells up there, as you know. And I think there's a building upon that success is something that will get us to the right place, probably to a new balance, but one that of course continues the industry that's so, so important to all of British Columbia and particularly that area. I remain optimistic and I think what I'm told is that work is undergoing underway now uh, at the negotiating table that is very pro uh, promising. 
Although you didn't mention it, I thought I'd just use the opportunity to go back and touch on the Section 7 Taltan agreements. Under our Declaration Act, uh, Sharon, as you well know, there are these the possibility of entering into agreements uh, where decision making is shared or where there is consent decision making after First Nation reviews it. Um, that will, of course, provide greater certainty to industry. Um, what's happening in the uh, uh, Taltan territory is extraordinarily exciting. We have the Red Crest uh, New Crest Mining Company and the SK Creek, which is Skeener Resources, um, entering their uh, uh, respective environmental assessment processes in the near term and doing so with a Section 7.1b, a sec one of these consent-based Section 7 agreements. Uh, being uh, undertaken in, through negotiations with uh, the tall tent. Uh, we, we believe that that's a very positive development. I know industry feels exactly that way, and we hope we can have a success story, a pilot, if you will, of just how powerful this tool can be uh, going forward. So uh, things are going very, very well. Um, I also just should say that I, I'm not really at liberty on the last one you talked about to say very much here in the Gitzala case, which of course was a petition for judicial review to the BC Supreme Court opposing mineral claims uh, registered in their territory under the Mineral Tenure Act. Um, I'm certainly well aware of it and certainly uh, have views on it, but be while it's before the court, I think it's probably prudent for me to say no more at this time. Thanks, Sharon. Not being your legal counsel, I would probably advise you to do the same. Um, but I, I am looking at some of the uh, comments and and questions that are coming through. And Minister Conroy, um, maybe I can ask you. Uh, and, and I'm taking one of the comments by uh, Charlie Rensby and some of the questions. And I'll just put it together. But you know, I, I was I always do this. I look at your mandate letters, and 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 one of the things that always stand out for me is just the commonality. Um, and one of them was uh, in your mandate letters, everybody, uh, Premier Horgan underscored the need for measurable outcomes, uh, active dialogue and ongoing outreach. And when you um, sort of commented on on the processes that you you undertook for Flynn Road reorganizations, you touched on many of that. Um, and we've you know heard about uh, through the forum words being tossed around and not at, the, at this panel, but partnerships, inclusion, collaboration. and. What I really want to get to is when it comes down to some of the recent steps that uh, have been taken by your ministry to modernize forest management, could you walk us through what type of processes were put in place and are being put in place to foster um, not just uh, local uh, community engagement, uh, Indigenous uh, nations collaboration and co-management, but also cross-ministry collaboration and industry collaboration? And um, you know how has that come into play when on initiatives like the old growth forest uh, deferrals? Uh, and you know, as as Minister uh, Rankin and Ralston touched on, um, how do you how do we use the forest management regime that and the modernization to strengthen the cumulative effects regime in BC? Okay, there's a lot of questions there, Sharon. Um, so I'll I mean I think the the old growth uh, strategic review and, and and what we're doing with the old growth initiatives is a perfect example of the cross collaboration uh, within our ministries and within government and, and, and across the province with other, with First Nations as well as stakeholders. So uh, as people know, just to recap, um, I mean, we made uh, some initial deferrals on, on old growth uh, back in 2020 we, uh, in nine areas of the province and we made two more um, last spring. Um, in the uh, Ferry Creek and Upper Walbran areas. And then this November, we announced the intention of, of how we were going to be working with First Nations to defer the harvesting of old growth in, in within 2.6 million hectares of our, of our most at risk forests as we implemented those recommendations of the old growth strategic review. And I think it's important to remind people when um, Al Gorley and, and um, Gary Merkel, uh, the two foresters well respected throughout the province, when they did that uh, strategic review, they talked to hundreds and hundreds of people, I probably thousands, but they talked to a lot of people across the province. They got input from communities, from First Nations, from uh, people that work in the industry and workers. Um, so they, they got a lot of input and the government heard loud and clear that people fully supported 
the 14 recommendations. And so we are implementing all 14 recommendations and, and we're working on all 14. The one recommendation, recommendation number six, is the one that comes up the most because it's the actual deferrals, it's working with the First Nations. And, and so that that's pretty critical in, in that we get that work done. And we're doing a lot of that uh, in cross collaboration with our uh, with ministries within the government of course uh, working with uh, minister rankin and and his ministry is as has been key in in working with first nations on engagement and and because uh, this is about reconciliation i have to keep reminding people that um some I you know nations are are very involved in, in harvesting and and want to continue that. They are doing really good work on on the land management on on how they are moving forward with their harvesting. They've already in many instances have begun to do the work on deferring old growth. It's part of their heritage. It's part of their culture. It's part of who they are, and and we need to respect that. Um, I think a perfect example of that is is our announcement yesterday with the Nanawakalis, the uh, you know the Council of Four Nations and uh, their agreement with the Western forest products, which uh, is, I know they're going to uh, defer over 2,500 um, hectares. And, and the work they're doing is, is they're mitigating job losses. They're mitigating the impacts to, to industry and working together to uh, ensure that uh, the nations are, are, are getting the, the the work that they want done as well. So it, it was an excellent example of, of how those partnerships are going to work. We've also been doing a lot of work with, with Minister Callan's uh, ministry, as he said. Um, he's helping us in so many ways. Uh, as we look at uh, the work that, from our intentions paper that we announced last uh, April, June, um, on how we're moving forward with our, our visions for forestry. And, and some of that is transforming from high volume to high value. And, and there's been a lot of work with, with uh, Minister Callan's ministry on that. And of course, the mass timber is a big one, but uh, there's, a, there's many other things we're working together on. Uh, as well, we're working with the Ministry of Environment. Uh, they've definitely lent us their expertise. And, and it's a real partnership in, in supporting the work of, that, uh, of the technical advisory panel that helped us to identify old growth priority deferral areas in the province and that advisory panel was made up of uh, five people with varying levels of expertise that we required in in being able to identify and it was interesting one of the things they did identify is areas that we had originally uh, thought were old growth in the province are in fact not and so they've been removed from that whole process so it you know it was really a, a good opportunity to bring those experts in and then we're also collaborating with with uh, other key ministries, uh, including um, ministries like municipal affairs. Um, uh, Minister Osborne has been working I know, with us to ensure we're reaching out to communities because I know um, uh, Charlie, he's, he's a counselor from uh, Burns Lake, I believe, and and I and I understand the angst from counselors and from communities where there is potential for uh, an impact regarding when it comes to old growth, and and we are very conscious of that and are working to put supports in place for communities. Um, Jerry's also helping us with that. Jerry is in the ministry, not the person. Um, and labor has been very involved. Labor is helping us with a whole suite of supports that we are going to have in place. In fact, we've already announced. Uh, 19 million dollars to be spent in this fiscal year uh, to help uh, to help workers to help industry to help you know to help the uh, contractors which who have never been helped before uh, to ensure that they get the supports if they to mitigate any of the the issues around uh, deferrals from old growth um, we are we've reinstating the, the very popular uh, bridging to retirement program that we brought in in 2019 that was done with the support of the Ministry of Labor um, to you know, people that are ready to retire and they want that bridging to retirement. Uh, what, what it's done is also for those working mills, it's allowed uh, people to retire early and allowed people to keep working, the younger workers to keep working, which is critically important. So, you know, that's a, that's a, a big partnership with Ministry of Labor. There's other uh, Pro programs that we're doing that uh, will help communities um, and as well as advanced education and training. They've done some really great comprehensive work on how they can support people to potentially learn a new trade, to get that support they need, to also look at, uh, you know, if there would be um, a mitigate, mitigating issues around uh, the deferrals. You know, one of the things they looked at is if you have uh, potentially two partners in a, in a, in a family, um, one is going to be impacted, the other one uh, might not be impacted, but the other one has a, a you know, a goal that uh, maybe he or she would like to work in the health industry, so he or she could actually get the training they need and, and to continue to support families. Because we also know 
uh, these impacts uh, could affect rural BC probably more than uh, downtown Vancouver, so to speak. But uh, so we want to make sure that the people stay in their communities. I, you know, I hear that a lot from people. They don't want to leave their communities. They they have they're well established there. They have their families there. They've been there for years. And and I've heard from mayors and, and councillors that you know they don't want people to leave their communities. So we're looking at ha having those supports in place so that uh, that that people can stay in their community with all these supports from all these different ministries that are working together to, to help. And that's just some of the ministries. There's a lot more I could go on, but just briefly to touch on the cumulative effects that you you referenced. I mean, both uh, Minister Ralston and Minister Rankin have referred to it quite a bit. And, and uh, our ministry also is very involved with the Blueberry Rivers uh, uh, Nation's decision. And we recognize that the other Treaty 8 nations uh, who have uh, their territories will also be impacted by past development activities. So we're working um, at the same time on shared areas of interest. Um, management of wildlife is big, uh, which is in our ministry. And and as Minister Rankin said, the restoration required to heal the land, which is, is critically important. And we've also established the strategic solutions table. I don't believe either of them mentioned that uh, with industry to work together on really creative solutions for addressing some of the shared interest areas, such as the restoration and development plans going forward. So there's a lot of collaboration that's, you know, I, one thing I think we've really done well as a government, we've got away from the days of when ministries worked in silos and God forbid that they interacted with each other. We are working together. Um, and I think that's really important to, to recognize. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a partnership of, of everyone. When we get to the cabinet table, we're working together as, as uh, ministries and, and staff know that. And, and it's, it's, it's working well. And, and we hear that from outside of, you know, out, outside of government, we, we're hearing that. So thanks. Thanks, Minister Conroy. And uh, you're right, you couldn't do it in four minutes, but that's okay. Um, uh, you know, talking about staying in place, uh, Minister Heyman, you touched on uh, on this earlier in terms of the concerns, which, you know, are, are not new to the go this government. Uh, it's been since, you know, the carbon tax and other things that have been introduced about the, the, the you know, around meaningful carbon pricing uh, support uh, to support trade export sectors to address that competitive concern um, and, and carbon leakage options that that are present so I, I just I, I know you briefly touched on it in, in your in your remark on a broader scale but I, I was wondering if you could give us an update on where the discussions are with the federal government on things like border carbon adjustments that the fed, federal government is engaging on and carbon pricing generally for industry what are the next big steps um, apart from the uh, increase in price uh, that's set to occur uh, on, on carbon pricing thanks Sharon I, I can't tell you uh, what hasn't been decided yet, but what I can tell you is, I think over the last two years, I've lost count of uh, of the number of meetings I've had with the business council, with the mining association, uh, stressing for me and for my colleagues um, how uh, we needed to ensure that uh, industry had support to remain competitive, uh, to uh, not be subject to carbon leakage uh, from the effects of the carbon tax. And one of the things we did um, as part of Stronger BC, a pandemic recovery was to significantly uh, raise the amount of capital that could be donated, or not donated, contributed by government to a, a capital project as part of the uh, the Clean BC uh, program for industry uh, uh, to uh, to bring in technologies or um, or process changes that uh, that reduced emissions from uh, fifty percent to ninety percent. It was a one year. Uh, one-year project but it uh it was highly successful and i think we've uh we were able therefore to target some of the industries with uh with very high emissions with projects that would make a much bigger difference than some smaller projects uh, uh would we obviously ultimately want to do both uh we know very clearly in the ministry that um if we're moving to uh a carbon tax of $170 a ton. The the program designs that worked at a $40 or $50 a ton price will not work. They need to be revisited and staff in the Climate Action Secretariat are um, consulting uh, with industry, uh, running ideas, doing models and meeting with the Ministry of Finance. Ultimately, as you know, tax policy is, uh, is a Ministry of Finance and Minister of Finance uh, decision, but we've, uh, we've engaged the ministry early to make the point 
uh, that there's a clear linkage between the programs we implement uh, for industry, whether it's uh, rewarding uh, those that are uh, at or near uh, world leading uh, carbon intensity uh, benchmarks or um, taking good uh, project submissions to reduce uh, carbon emissions and funding them. That if we do not do that, it uh, it hurts everyone in the province uh, and ultimately it hurts uh, a government. So we need to look at that carbon tax revenue, as you said earlier, uh, Sharon, as uh, turn it from a stick to a carrot. Uh, there are uh, a number of discussions going on with the federal government. I, I've only met with the new federal minister once, but I'm uh, going to meet again shortly. I know uh, when I was in Glasgow, um, Mark Carney and the prime minister were on a, a carbon pricing panel talking about the important role of carbon pricing and reducing emissions. And most studies show that, uh, if not all studies show that carbon pricing is the most efficient, uh, financially efficient way to reduce emissions because it lets uh, industry and the market uh, respond with the most efficient uh, solution rather than, uh, it's not that regulation doesn't have a role, but if it can be done otherwise, other ways, it's important. Uh, the prime minister uh, mentioned that uh, we cannot allow uh, the lack of carbon pricing or regulations in other sectors to uh, undermine the efforts in uh, Canada or other countries that have them. So I know that border adjustments, because he mentioned them specifically, are very much on the radar. Now that clearly protects um, Canadian industry and British Columbia industry from imports. It does less for exports. So I don't want anyone to think that, uh, that I don't get that. Uh, we do, and we're looking for program design uh, that's uh, a result of full engagement with industry that will ensure as we transition to our commitment to raise the uh, carbon price, uh, that we do it in a way that continues to keep uh, BC industry world leading uh, and therefore able to market commodities and products as well as as well as competitive. Thank you, Mr. Heyman. And maybe I can stick with you uh, and probably uh, I would think Mr. Connery and, and Rankin on this one. The question is around uh, the fact that we focus so much on carbon, um, but also what's needed to protect the protect biodiversity. And I know we touched on uh, on the Imperial Metals um, uh, tenure issue yes, uh, earlier that was announced yesterday, but perhaps uh, I'm not sure who wants to take that first, Mr. Connery and Mr. Heyman. Um, can you touch on just some of the uh, some of the steps that are being taken to not just focus on carbon, but focus on production of biodiversity and other emissions in, generally? If nobody jumps up, Mr. Uh, Heyman, I might go to you. Sure. Uh, well, I think uh, the point is it's not either or, it's additive. Uh, we need to do both. I think uh, Minister Conroy has spoken a lot about uh, uh, the reasons why we're transforming the forest industry. We know that we cannot afford, and the Old Growth Strategic Review said, uh, we can't afford for a range of issues, both uh, biodiversity and carbon storage, to uh, go past a certain tipping point with old growth. And in order to have a healthy forest industry, it's better to begin that uh, transition now, in our view, and to uh, uh, find ways to add value as well as in enhance those areas where we can sustainably harvest. Uh, we've also in, invested, uh, whether it's through our climate preparedness and adaptation strategy, looking at ways that, uh, <clears throat> that we can invest in uh, nature-based solutions uh, as part of Stronger BC. Uh, we set aside $37 million to conserve and restore wetlands, watersheds, uh, and ecosystems through our healthy watersheds initiatives. Uh, there are a range of things that uh, that we're working on, including, uh, I won't speak to the work we're doing to uh, deal with wildfire risk uh, by investing in habitat. Um, Minister Conroy knows the details on that, but uh, very much for both uh, uh, ecosystem services and carbon uh, storage and climate resiliency, uh, both emission reduction and protecting uh, biodiversity and natural ecosystems go hand in hand. And uh, we need to work on both, and we are. Thank you, Mr. Heyman. Um, so this question, I'm not sure who's able to answer it, but essentially goes to some of the issues that we've had before, which is the growth in, in industry and uh, the relatable growth in labor. The question is, given uh, this, the need for critical BC infrastructure, doesn't it make sense 
to move away from the procurement model that allows jobs to go to only specific unions, but to open it up more broadly. Um, and perhaps Minister Callan, I can, uh, you read my mind, so go for it. <laughs> uh, I happily take this question. And uh, and I have to say that uh, I think the question is referring to community benefit agreements. And uh, we believe as a government that they are critically important. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, so that local communities get access to projects that are happening in their backyards. Uh, gone are the days where we build major infrastructure and we're building it with all temporary foreign workers. We want to ensure that when we invest in infrastructure that local communities, uh, people in communities, uh, First Nations get access to opportunities in uh, the procurement process. We want to ensure that um, that Indigenous communities and women and underrepresented groups who don't traditionally get an opportunity in that space to get more opportunities because they are good paying jobs. Now, that being said, uh, if you look through BC, projects are not all being built through community benefit agreements. Here in my community, North Delta, we have um, a $300 million project that's happening uh, to upgrade our roads and it's being done by um, by, by CLAC, uh, in fact. Uh, and so projects are being done in different models throughout the province, uh, but it's critically important for us as a government to ensure that um, that communities and people that have traditionally been left out of the opportunities uh, in, in infrastructure development get a real opportunity to benefit from that because it raises more people up, it pulls more people into the labor pool, uh, and we desperately need that in the coming years. We, are, we have uh, a different challenge than we've had in the past. We have more jobs than people. And so we're going to need to invest in childcare to be able to get more uh, predominantly women in the workforce, but all people back into the workforce. We're going to need to uh, make uh, important investments like we have been in the last few years uh, in skills training so that we have the, the, the skills that needed to take the job opportunities ahead of us. And of course, we're going to need to have some uh, additional immigration uh, to British Columbia, but not in a temporary way. We want to see people come here, uh, put roots here, uh, establish families, uh, contribute to the community. So we are looking at that question. Uh, it's going to be a critical question going forward. But we want to make sure that uh, everyone gets a chance to benefit from economic recovery and not be left behind. Thank you, Mr. Callan. And the other the next question on the panel, which uh, I, I believe has been answered, um, it was answered by Mr. Allison actually yesterday and uh, touched on today. I'll read it for the for the benefit uh, of the person that um, assent it. It essentially said, "Can you comment on how the permitting process will differ, um, or the permitting process will differ from what's currently in in in, in play, and how will it?" actually hold industry accountable. Um, and like I said, I think that was answered yesterday in terms of the, the distinction between the, the, the roles of the chief administrative officer, et cetera. Um, and I'm cognizant that we have one minute. Um, it was a great discussion and time's always very tight on these things. So with that, um, thank you so much, uh, ministers, for joining us today, making the time, uh, showing up early and doing your tech checks. Um, and, and thank you also for those of you listening or participating. You know, uh, I just want to say this. When I was listening to Minister Wilkinson, uh, and he's not on this panel, so I can say this. Um, I, I heard the message, was, which was very much similar to yours. But the one thing I heard was this constant referral to the need for a plan, the need for a plan. And I, I frankly, in my mind, was like, well, I certainly hope there is a plan because we're doing a lot of things to put that plan into effect. And if we're not, um, we're going to be misguided somewhere somewhere along the line. So hearing uh, you today, I, I think there is a plan. Uh, I think you know we have a, a means by which decision-making can be focused on strategic projects that can benefit the province, that can advance the opportunity that decarbonization be, uh, uh, brings, and that actually gets away from the polarization that, that can occur when we're taking wholesale change uh, that is needed to to do to you know have that industrial strategy that Don Lindsay spoke about. Um, the last thing I really want to say is I encourage you to go visit uh, miningformiracles.ca. They're trying to raise money for the BC Children's Hospital. So for those of you listening, please uh, visit them and see how you can support them. Thank you, Sarah Weber and the team and the ministerial staff for making this happen. And I hope you have a rest of uh, a, a conference that is full of learnings and uh, full of good conversation. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carolyn Chisholm. And on behalf of Rio Tinto, I want to thank the ministers for participating in today's panel.
It was a valuable discussion that reinforces for us the opportunities in British Columbia and Canada around the development and advancement of our world leading natural resource industries. I also want to thank my friend Sharon Singh for skillfully moderating today's panel as only she can. And thank you to the audience for your participation and great questions to advance the dialogue. Putting collective commitments into action to achieve our ESG advantage involves navigating complex challenges, whether it's our regulatory processes or meeting the expectations of communities. We will need to be committed to collaboration and partnership if we are to successfully tackle the challenges and maximize the potential of our natural resource wealth and build and sustain confidence in our sector. I know we'll explore these challenges and opportunities as part of this year's Natural Resources Forum, and I look forward to the discussions. I wish you every success with this year's conference. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you everyone for tuning in to our first session today. Now we're pleased to share a brief video from the Mining Association of BC. After that, we ask that you please return to the agenda and select the next session to view the live stream, a keynote from Sue Pache.